hidden messages in Beatles films. Number two, help. Warning, the world is run by occultists. If you don't know and accept this fact, stop this video now. It's not for you. This video is going to get dark. You have been warned. The purpose of the film Help, although light-hearted on the surface, was much darker at its depths. This was a predictive programming of the sacrifice of a band member. That band member was, of course, Paul, but to deflect attention from him, they used Ringo as the decoy. They used the same tactic on Sergeant Pepper's With a Little Help from My Friends to draw attention away from Paul's replacement, Billy. That's why many people incorrectly believe that Billy Shears is Ringo. The occulted cabal tried to work around universal law by releasing their agendas into the world under the guise of entertainment. Once they have informed the public of their schemes, if the masses don't respond, the occultists consider this to be a tacit agreement. That is exactly what happened with help. The fact that they called it help, rather than its original title of Eight Arms to Hold You, speaks volumes. The Beatles did need help, especially Paul. But instead, this need for help became twisted into a dark comedy, a Bond-style parody with all the associated MI6 deep state connotations. There are also other agendas here at play. Subtly, the 1960s agenda of female leads as the hero and the incoming feminism can also be found in this film. It's an idea that gets overlooked in help. The Beatles constantly find themselves in trouble, in what is largely a chase film. Who repeatedly saves the day? A woman. The female lead character, Arme. She is a strong, independent woman who betrays her own group in order to do what is morally right. Although ideological in its own way, this film could not be made now. The casting of white actors to play Indians would be considered outrageous race swapping, especially as the Indian cult members are also betrayed as bloodthirsty killers. Before we dive into a breakdown of the film, let's first consider its advertising. You will now hear one of the several US radio commercials made for the original release of Help in 1965. It's aimed at the adult moviegoer, who needs help because they were slow to watch the first Beatles film and fall into the Beatles spell. Hey you, adult moviegoer. Better wise up. You need help. We happen to know you were one of the last people to see the Beatles in their first motion picture, A Hard Day's Night. You didn't believe the kids. You didn't believe the critics, columnists, TV personalities. And when the Boston pop started playing Beatles songs, you didn't believe them either. You must have had some kind of a problem. Won't you please help me? But don't worry. Help is on the way. Help is the new Beatles movie in color. Help is sharp wit and highly creative direction. Help is spine-tickling adventure and side-tingling laughter. Help is lively music. And help is that special Beatles eye view of this much too serious world. So get smart. Be the first adult on your block to seek help. The United Artists release. Won't you please, please help me? Help will help. You better believe it. If you want to listen to all of these commercials, which are full of castigation and coercion, you will find them embedded as Easter eggs into the menu of the 2007 DVD of Help. Now let's consider the image of the Beatles allegedly doing semaphore on the film poster and album cover of Help. I remember looking up the hand signals that the Beatles are doing here in an encyclopedia when I was a child. I was very disappointed that their signals didn't spell out help. However, 
I didn't understand what they really did spell out, and I do mean spell. I've included a footnote from page 596 of the Memoirs of Billy Shears. It talks about the Egyptian deities Nuit, Hadit, and Ra Horket, equating archetypically to Isis, Osiris, and Horus. I'll now read the rest of the last paragraph. It says, As with every age, at the dawn of our aeon of Horus, Hadit and Nuit are embodied and slain, passing essence into Ra Hor Ket. Hadit was found in Paul, Nuit was found in Lady Di. They co inhabited this realm for 1,899 days before Hadit, Paul, was sent to Ra Hor Ket, William. On help, the lads do not spell help in semaphore flag signals. I've blown up the section underneath that explains what the Beatles were asked to signal. From left to right, Osiris slain, the element of earth set fighting, Typhon and Apophis, and Morning Isis. Three of these signals are featured in the Thelemic magical ritual of LVX, or Light of the Cross which is celebrated by both Alistair Crowley's AA and also the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. The odd one out is Earth Set Fighting, which is part of elemental magical rituals. On this slide, I've rearranged the signals into the correct order of the Light of the Cross magical ritual. If we include a still frame from help of the character Foot, signalling Osiris Risen as well, we have the full set. Why didn't they get the Beatles to include the Osiris Risen signal? I don't know. Maybe because Paul was still alive at the time. He, as Osiris, would not be Risen until his ritualistic murder had been performed, and his soul had been transmigrated into Billy, who was Horus. For comparison, here are the Light of the Cross drawings taken from Thelemapedia. Sorry about the size, but I wanted to get all of the signals into one shot. This is the opening shot of Help. The occulted cabal start as they mean to go on, with an image of the dreaded Kali. Although, throughout the film, they refer to her as Kaili. It is a parody, after all and perhaps they were trying to avoid the complaints of millions of offended Hindus. Then we see a parody of the 19th century Tuggy cult blood sacrifice, although really it is symbolic of the occulted cabal's own ceremonies. I don't think the actual Tuggy cult did anything this elaborate. They mostly just strangled their victims and then robbed them. Here are the opening words to help spoken by the cult leader, Clang. In the name of Praverti, daughter of the mountains, whose embrace with Rani made the whole world tremble, whose name is the terrible, whose name is baneful, whose name is inaccessible, whose name is the black mother, mother of darkness, Kaili. We turn our hearts to Kaili, drinker of blood, black mother, Kaili. Killer of demons, gorge on this flesh, our offering. A couple of points to note. Kaili, of course, is really Kali. Pravati is probably a corruption of Pravati, another Hindu goddess associated with Kali, who is the mother of the universe. And Rani is actually a title, like queen or princess, so it doesn't make sense. Perhaps it was originally Rama, which is an avatar of Vishnu. With these adjustments, it would read, In the name of Pavati, daughter of the mountains, whose embrace with Rama made the whole world tremble, whose name is the terrible, whose name is baneful, whose name is inaccessible, whose name is the black mother, mother of darkness, Kali. We turn our hearts to Kali. Drinker of blood, black mother, Kali. Killer of demons, gorge on this flesh, our offering. 
It's pretty dark, but hopefully that at least makes more sense in this context. Many years later, in 1984, rather aptly, Hollywood would pick up on the ideas expressed here in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. You may remember these scenes from the Kali Ma ritual in the film. This film was considered so offensive in India that the Indian government banned it when it was first released. In Help, the death cult has many priestesses. Notice their headdresses with their sunburst-inspired design. This is associated with the illumination of ideas within the occult. The sacrificial victim is carried in and placed onto an altar. She is both painted and dressed in bright red, as we can see in this impressive overhead shot from the film. I can only assume that this colour red is symbolic of blood. The ceremony is interrupted when Arme notices that the victim is not wearing the sacrificial ring. As she lifts up her hand to the camera, the red shade of her skin is akin to that of a body that has been flensed or deskinned. As we find out later, Arme's sister is the current sacrificial victim. She now gets a reprieve as it's revealed that she has sent the ring to Ringo in England so that she can escape her own death. The whole congregation watched the Beatles performing Help on a film projector, with the reality being that it is truly the Beatles who now need help. The outraged clang divulges to the film's audience that without the sacrifice there is no congregation, and without the congregation there is no more me. This is a little insight into the mentality of the cabal. Undeterred, however, the cults fly off to England. Meanwhile in London, the Beatles are chauffeured home. Each of them open a neighbouring front door in a row of terraced houses. A couple of nice old ladies wave at them from across the street. So natural, one says to the other and just the same as they always were. To counteract this illusion of the nice, normal northern lads, we see the boys inside their crazy home, which turns out to be all four houses knocked through together. This is symbolic of the smoke and mirrors of the Beatles' identities and the nature of the Beatles' myth. John immediately runs to his bookcase and pulls out a copy of his own book, a Spaniard in the works, and kisses it. He falls into his pit-style bed and starts to read. Later on, we can see him surrounded by several copies of both his first two books of nonsense verse, just to ram home the product placement. Meanwhile, Paul has run down some stairs inside a cupboard door. He then pops up on a rising platform, playing an organ. Paul is shown in all of the Beatles films playing a keyboard instrument. Even though the real Paul didn't play any of them that well. Sometimes I do wonder if this was part of the setup for Billy to take over. Billy's first instrument is the piano, and it always struck me as odd that Paul suddenly and unnaturally became a great pianist sometime around 1967. Without the seeding of the idea that Paul could also play the piano, this jump in skill set would have been even more obvious. As we zoom into Paul, we notice two things. One, he's not actually playing the notes that are heard in the film. If he really could play the organ, why didn't he play the actual music that is heard by the audience? Two, the sheet music stand is covered with Superman and Jimmy Olsen comics. This immediately made me think of the run-out groove of Sergeant Pepper, which has the back message of, we'll all be magic supermen. I think the Superman comics are meant to relate back to the Osiris and Horus myth, which, akin to the story of Jesus in Christianity, evokes a sense of a saviour who dies and is risen again. 
This is exactly what the cabal are hoping to do with Paul and Billy. Next, it's the turn of George with his zany indoor garden, complete with an indoor lawn, crazy paving and garden furniture. George later became an extremely keen gardener, so this seems oddly prophetic. In the Beatles' home, and furthest from the camera, we can see the vending machines for various drinks and snacks. The camera zooms in on Ringo as he tries to get a sandwich. Arme, waiting inside the vending machine, makes her first attempt to get the sacrificial ring back from Ringo. Later that night, whilst the Beatles are all asleep, Arme makes her second attempt to get the ring. This is the first of many times that green and purple lighting is used to illuminate the shot. I wondered what the significance is for the cabal. Perhaps it relates to the heart and crown chakras, respectively. Maybe the purple is a signal for royalty, and the green related to spring. A trip through Alistair Crowley's Toth tarot deck will perhaps lead you to many cards featuring one or the other of these colours. The only card with both colours equally shown is the Five of Swords, the card of defeat, complete with its inverted pentagram. In memoirs, Paul is associated with a sword suit in a tarot deck. Later on in Help, we will see him walk past a large number five on the wall. I don't know if any of that is relevant, I'm just throwing out ideas. Throughout this film, Arme does a lot of winking, which is a cunning way to sneak in one-eye symbolism, under the guise of a joke. Here is the first time we see Arme wink, and it happens to be at Paul. He's not the beetle with the ring, points out Arme. Aren't I? says a puzzled Paul. No, unfortunately, replies Arme, who then giggles like a schoolgirl. It's clear that Arme was being set up as a minor love interest for Paul. This film is a Bond parody, without the James Bond character, which means there is a big hole to fill. I think the Cabal would have liked Paul to have filled that role, but Paul is the cute beetle, not an MI6 assassin, so the idea falls flat. Next, a Bond parody car chase ensues with a colt following on in a Harrods delivery van. The choice of van seems conspicuous. How many Harrods shoppers live in terraced housing? Nevertheless, the chase is accompanied with the actual Bond theme. This is because both this film and the Bond franchise were owned by United Artists at the time. You will find a great many Bond parodies in this film. Beyond the humour, remember that the author of the Bond novels, the former British naval intelligence officer Ian Fleming, was also a friend of the MI5 spy master Maxwell Knight, the alleged killer of the real Paul McCartney. Maxwell Knight was the inspiration for the character of M in his Bond novels. Maxwell Knight brought the black magician Alastair Crowley into British intelligent work during World War II. Ultimately, all of them knew each other. The Harrods van has a concealed weapon inside the headlamp, in the way that Bond is always supplied with such things by Q. Sadly, the Harrods van's weapon is a damp squib, merely pouring a pile of nails onto the road. Still, considering how Paul was meant to have been killed in a car crash, I do wonder if the two are related. Was Paul made to crash because of something thrown into the road? Then we get this on-screen card that says five more attempts are made to steal the ring, meaning seven in total so far. In the major arcana of a tarot deck, these numbers correspond to the Hierophant and the Chariot. In Crowley's Toth deck, the Hierophant is not just some boring pope, he is a knowledgeable dark occultist. The chariot indicates victory, 
usually after prolonged hard work and planning, with obstacles in the way. This could all well be a synchronicity, but also describes the scheming of the cabal. Very briefly, the next few attempts to steal the ring are using an electromagnet to attract the ring, a member of the death cult hiding in a post box to grab the ring off Ringo's finger, a blade used to slice off Ringo's finger, utilising the mechanism of a weighing machine, a hand dryer being switched from blow to suck, which somehow destroys the room. At this point, Ringo, who for some reason is always portrayed as stupid, suddenly comprehends the situation he is in. The other Beatles laugh at his slowness, in just the same way that the Cabal laugh at normies, who do not understand how the whole world is steered by them. At the same time, Arme breaks the fourth wall, to tell the audience that she is not what she seems, just like most cultural revolutions. The next attempt to snatch the ring is made while the Beatles are in the studio, recording You're Gonna Lose That Girl. This scene is pure propaganda and is included to perpetuate the myth of how the Beatles produced their albums. First of all, why are the Beatles recording in a live in-studio method? Whoever actually played the instrumental parts of the Beatles songs is debatable. What is not debatable is that the parts weren't recorded all at once. That would be very difficult to do on either a four or eight track recorder, which is mostly what was used in the 1960s. Even on a recorder with sufficient tracks, if a song is recorded with the musicians this close together and all at once, it makes the mix down very difficult because all the parts bleed into each other due to a lack of acoustic separation. This is particularly true if the recording engineer has to do a lot of bouncing down, as is typical when working with a four or eight track. Secondly, the guitars are neither DI'd nor mic'd up, and the drum kit isn't mic'd up properly either. This is all for show. Thirdly, why have they turned the lights out on the band? Partway through the song, we see Hall at a keyboard, although I question if it is really him, as his head is very long, like Billy's. Also, why is the low-level lighting now in weird colours? After the song has finished, the producer from the control room says they will have to do another take, due to interference. Are you buzzing? he asks the band. No, replies John. I brought the car, in what is an obvious but sly drug reference. The buzzing in question turns out to be another attempt to steal the ring, this time made via a cartoon-styled cutting out of the floor around Ringo's drum kit. Ringo is captured by the cult, who then try to carry out a Bond villain-style death by chainsaw. But never fear! Arme is here, with the first of 13 occasions where she saves one or more of the Beatles' lives, this time by throwing a symbol at her cult leader's head. I don't know why Arme rescues him. Does she suddenly abandon her culture because she likes the Beatles, or is she just plotting against her leader? Whatever the reason... Arme and Ringo flee into the corridor and part separate ways. As they do, they form a visual dualism of Eastern and Western cultures, as well as the yin and yang of black and white. Interestingly, these are also the colours of death in many Eastern and Western traditions. Consider what colours you wear to a funeral. I'm a Buddhist, so I would wear white to symbolise the death of the ego but my family are Catholic, and at those funerals, I would still wear black. Now we see the Beatles walk down a central London street. As the camera pans up, we see the sign reads, Switzerland. 
This, of course, is where LSD was first produced by Albert Hoffman in 1938. He worked at the Sandoz Laboratories in Basel, Switzerland. Also, by the end of the filming of Help, the Beatles' dentist, John Riley, will have introduced John and George to LSD. Another reference intended here could be B at Lezo, which is written on the front of Sergeant Pepper. This phrase is made by simply adding an O to the name Beatles. Billy tells us in his memoirs on page 183 that Lezo is a street in Masako, Switzerland, and that the word means injured in Italian. This is what they were wishing upon Paul, for him to be fatally injured. The sign might also be a reference to any Swiss bank accounts that were used to fund the Beatles' psyop. Next we see a series of London landmarks, which must have been both difficult and expensive to film on. I guess all doors open wide when you are the Beatles. First, a cult member is hiding in a barrel-styled crow's nest of a tall ship. I can only guess that it's a royal research ship, as those had these kind of crow's nests to allow secure lookout points at extra high elevation in icy and dangerous waters. Whatever this ship is, it probably went to the Arctic or somewhere similar. Next we see another cult member on the platform of the Duke of York column. It was built in 1832, but the platform has been closed to the public since 1850 because it was used repeatedly by people taking their own lives. The column is 1,653 inches tall. 1 plus 6 plus 5 plus 3 is 15, and 1 and 5 is 6, the Cabal's favourite number. The statue at the top is of Prince Frederick, the grand old Duke of York from the nursery rhyme, which mocks him for his poor military command. He died £2 million in debt in 1827. With inflation, in 2023, that's almost £174 million of debt. When he died, his brother wanted to construct this column in his memory, but no one wanted to pay for it because nobody liked him. So instead, they took one day's pay from every British soldier to pay for it. I'm sure the soldiers were delighted, as they had no say in the matter. The Duke was a Knight of the Most Honourable Order of the Garter, and is wearing their robes. This is the highest order of chivalry in Britain, outranked only by the Victoria Cross or the George Cross. There's no direct link from this order to Freemasonry, but there is a huge crossover between the two memberships. As the second son of George III, I'd be stunned if he wasn't a Freemason. The Duke of York column and statue were designed by Benjamin Dean Wyatt, who also worked for the East India Company, which was owned by the Rothschilds. And here's a photo of what it looks like now. Now we see a cult member on top of the Wellington Arch, next to the Quad Rigger. This statue of four horses with a chariot was designed by Adrian Jones. He was a British Army captain and a royal veterinarian who specialised with horses. He served in many locations, including Egypt, in the 1880s. After he left the British Army, he became an artist, mostly producing equine statues. He was made a knight of the Royal Victorian Order. And here's a photo of what that looks like now. After each of the cult members has signalled each other from their points of elevation, the camera takes us to a country garden scene. The death cult leader Clang is lamenting to a Christian clergyman about sacrifice being unpopular these days, whilst considering new tactics to get young people more involved in them. Oh my goodness me, he cries. Sex is creeping in. Young people see it in the bazaars, marketplaces, temple. No wonder they turn up their noses at a mystical impulse. We're taking up fox hunting, so young people are involved in their sacrifices. 
and will understand the deep significance of blood well shed. Of course, I don't expect you to see eye to eye with me, but I hope we can agree to differ. By now, the Beatles have made their way to a somewhat fake Indian restaurant. Ringo shows his ring to the fake Indian doorman. Does this ring mean anything to you? he asks. Um, Freemason? replies the baffled doorman. Even if the Beatles weren't Freemasons themselves, the majority of the people in high positions around them certainly were. The Beatles are shown around the restaurant, unaware that the cult members have infiltrated the place and killed most of the staff. Arme dances with Paul in order to tell him that they are in great danger. But of course, she couldn't help but wink at the camera again as well. This shot is as close to a romantic shot as we ever get in the film. It's obvious that they hope for more. It's a sort of reminder to the women in the audience. Attention, ladies, this is the guy you're meant to fancy. Meanwhile, the death cult leader and Ringo meet. Everyone orders soup, and knowing that the Beatles love the Marx Brothers, I wonder if this is a reference to duck soup. John fishes round granny glasses out of his soup, which belonged to the recently deceased cook. I wonder if this is a reference to the fact that John spent a good portion of his life deliberately not wearing his glasses out of a sense of vanity, despite the fact that he desperately needed them. This particular style of glasses seems prophetic, though, because he will wear them for much of the 70s. John then pours out a season ticket from his soup. John quips that he likes a lot of seasoning in his soup. Beyond the obvious wordplay, I wondered if this was a subtle reference to the LSD that was slipped into John and George's coffee at the end of their meal with their dentist around the same time that this scene was filmed. Their dentist was the 34-year-old cosmetic dentist John Riley. He was the son of a Metropolitan Police Constable. Riley was so hip that he flew out to visit the Beatles on set in the Bahamas during the filming of Help in February 1965. That was the first part of this movie to be filmed. According to the book Riding So High by Joe Gooden, the founder of the Beatles Bible, George thought Riley got the LSD from Victor Lowndes, who ran the Playboy Mansion in London, which of course was a CIA honeypot stink, who in turn got it from Timothy Leary. Apparently this was not the case. The book advises that a friend of Riley's knew a chemist making LSD in a remote farmhouse in Wales and requested a small delivery. To be honest, both stories seem pretty crazy but I'm more inclined to believe George over the Beatles' Bible. By this point in the film, it is increasingly obvious to Ringo that he is in serious danger. However, if he had any doubt, the sabre slicing through the table is enough to make all of them run for their lives. The Beatles run off to the nearest ring specialist. Not just any jewellers, but Aspreys a jewellers that supplies many royal families, including the British royal family. The front of their shop bears the British royal family's coat of arms. Once inside, a jeweller tries many different tools in order to remove the ring from Ringo's finger. All of them break. Finally, he resorts to the wheel. Not the wheel, quips John. Even the Royal House of Hanover had the wheel, sir, replies the jeweller. However, this is to no avail, because the wheel also breaks. I wonder if all of this talk of the wheel is actually a sly reference to the breaking wheel. Despite originally being a medieval instrument of punishment and execution, it was actually last used in 1841. The Germans were among the last to use it well into the 19th century, thus meaning that even the Royal House of Hanover had the wheel. Also note 
that it was under the royal house of Hanover that Asprey, the jewellers, gained their royal charter. The house of Hanover originated in 1635. After the collapse of their royal house, the family has been in Austria since 1866 and thus took on Austrian nationality as well as their German and British nationalities. This is interesting when we consider that the Beatles run off to Austria later on in the film. The breaking wheel was also the inspiration for a line in a poem by Alexander Pope, Who breaks a butterfly upon a wheel? This has since become a saying in English, meaning the use of excessive force to do something minor, especially if it results in breakage. The breaking wheel is used to shatter the bones of the body before tying that body to the wheel, suspending it in the air on a pole and leaving it to rot. This shattering of the body and the breaking of butterflies makes me also think of MK Ultra and similar mind control techniques, which shatter the mind instead. In 1966, the Rolling Stones drug bust was famously reported in a Times editorial piece with the headline, Who Breaks a Butterfly on a Wheel? Is there an in-joke here? The butterfly in question was Mick Jagger. The wheel was the judicial system, which had just sentenced the Rolling Stone to a draconian prison sentence for a minor drug offence. With the jeweller out of ideas to help Ringo, he tells him, you need to see a specialist. Somehow, this equates to the Beatles finding the nearest scientist, although it's not known how or why they know these scientists. On one level, the next scene is a parallel with Bond going to see Q in order to get kitted out with some state-of-the-art secret weaponry. In comparison, the Beatles are left in the hands of two mad scientists who were hell-bent on ruling the world. Ringo now finds himself in what looks like a deep state mind control experiment. We have to ask ourselves, who do these scientists actually represent? Tavistock? MI5 or MI6? Or maybe the CIA? After strapping Ringo to a device that is dangerous enough to require everyone else in the room to hide in a bunker, George asks the assistant if Ringo will still be able to play the drums. Did he play a lot? replies the assistant. I understand this is meant to be a joke, but it makes me think of Bernard Purdy's accusation that Ringo did not play on the Beatles' albums. The scientists repeatedly make references to their equipment being American and so much more advanced. Their only problem is that it has all the wrong voltage for a British electricity supply and it short circuits as a result. Despite their best attempt, the scientists cannot remove the ring from Ringo's finger. With a ring like that, I could, dare I say, rule the world. I must have that ring, declares Foote, the senior scientist. By this point, the Beatles realise that they need to get Ringo away from the two mad scientists, and John goes to fight them. Before John can save the day, Armé beats him to it by breaking into the room with a gun. The Beatles hide behind her for protection, with John sceptically asking if they can trust her. She's had your fingers before, Ringo. Paul speaks up for her. Well, that was a mistake. I can vouch for her. They're very close. This line suggests that some romantic engagement has quietly taken place between them. Once again, it's done for the benefit of the female members of the audience. Reminder, ladies, Paul is the cute one. Let me explain this point if you've missed it. The Cabal needed Paul to be the favourite Beatle because it harnessed energy into their magical rituals. They only sacrificed the best. The mad scientists turn a laser onto the retreating Beatles and army in another Bond parody. As once again the fuse blows, we hear Foot crying out loud in exasperation. MIT was after me. 
wanted me to rule the world for them as the Beatles and Army back out of the door. It's the brain drain. His brain is draining, mutters Foot, whilst holding his arms in the Osiris risen position. Consider the alleged way in which Paul dies and his body is dealt with, according to memoirs. In that book, we are reminded that, in accordance to ancient Egyptian custom, Paul's brain was removed and consumed. And by that I mean they ate his brain. I told you this would get dark. All pharaohs in a continuing line of succession practice this tradition, in order for every pharaoh to contain every other pharaoh, like a set of Russian dolls. Back home with Arme, the Beatles perform You've Got to Hide Your Love Away. This song is used to facilitate Paul's awkward winking at Arme and introduce more one-eye symbolism from Paul. Although this song is often thought to be a reference to gay love and possibly Brian Epstein, I wonder if, in this context, it's also a prophetic reference to John coping with the death of Paul without ever being able to publicly speak about it. Let's consider the words and bear in mind that, when referencing Paul, the songwriters often swapped the gender as a disguise. Here I stand, with head in hand, turn my face to the wall. If she's gone, I can't go on, feeling two foot small. Everywhere people stare, each and every day. I can see them laugh at me, and I hear them say, Hey, you've got to hide your love away. How can I even try? I can never win. Hearing them, seeing them, in the state I'm in. How could she say to me, love will find a way? Gather round, all you clowns, let me hear you say, hey, you've got to hide your love away. At this point, Arme pours out a syringe, and George faints. Now look what you've done with your filthy eastern ways, John mockingly replies. Paul, however, seems interested. What filthy eastern ways are these? he inquires. Arme then explains about her cult and her sister, the sacrificial victim that we saw at the beginning of the film. As the sun sets, she now has a reprieve, and Ringo is next in line to be sacrificed. By the way, sunset is a reference to Egyptian mythology. In one version, Horus as Ra the sun god, with his evil uncle Set, have a fight which results in the temporary death of the sun, and according to the mythology, that's why we have night time. Arme pulls out a drug that would temporarily shrink Ringo's finger, enough to remove the sacrificial ring. The colours don't show up here well, but close up, the drug is purple and green, just like the purple and green lighting that I discussed earlier. Paul asks if the drug is mainlining or habit-forming, a reference to the incoming drug culture lined up by the cabal in the fabled 1967 Summer of Love. A violent knock at the door disturbs Ame, and Paul accidentally takes a large dose of the drug instead. Paul shrinks like Alice in Alice in Wonderland. I did a whole video on the influence of Lewis Carroll and Alice in Wonderland on the Beatles, so I won't repeat things here. Please go and look up that video if you haven't watched it. As they look for the tiny paw, John picks up the needle. Is this another prophetic reference to the heroine that John will use after Paul dies? Billy states in memoirs that without heroine and his handler wife, Yoko Ono, John would have given up music altogether. Paul has an Alice in Wonderland-styled adventure on the floor, with all the LSD and mushroom references that go with that. He wraps himself in George's discarded chewing gum wrapper and hides inside the now gigantically large ashtray. Meanwhile, the death cult are outside, hiding in a hearse. This made me think of something I saw on one of the I Am a Phony videos. 
For those who don't know, these were a set of mysterious videos posted on YouTube many years ago that discussed the PID theme. Judging by their content, they must have been made by or with the approval of a Beatles insider. In one of those videos, I remember seeing the registration paperwork for a Beatles vehicle. It was a 1965 Austin Vanden Plas Princess, with the ownership transferred to the Beatles Limited and stamped by the DVLA office with the date of 15th of September 1966, just a few days after Paul's death. Memoir states that Paul had a funeral with his close family and Jane Asher present. Was this the car used for that funeral? I'll try to zoom in for you so you can read the paperwork. Here's one side. And here's the other. In the 60s, these cars were also used as a hearse because they could be easily converted into one, although some were made as a hearse as standard. Here's a picture of it. I know it's not a great picture. No good pictures of the car seem to exist. But here's a picture of another car of the exact same year and model. Strangely, John Lennon also bought the hearse version of the car in the 70s. He had this 1956 version, the year that he got his first guitar and formed the Quarrymen. This car was up for auction in 2016 for £200,000. The death cult break in through the window with a cry of Kylie! As a fight breaks out between the Death Cult and the Beatles, Wagner's prelude to Act 3 of Lemongrin starts to play. This is interesting in so many ways, but I'll try to be brief. Lemongrin is about the Arthurian legend. Percival, the Knight of the Holy Grail, is sent in a boat pulled by swans to rescue a maiden who can never ask his identity. Firstly, is this a reference to the never-to-be-named Billy. It also reminds me of the chemical wedding of Kristen Rosenkreutz, a medieval alchemical narrative spread over a week. On the third day of the story, there is a famous riddle from which the author tries to guess the name of an unnamed virgin bride, which is meant to sum to 55 in Gematria. It's too complicated a story to dive into here, but if you know it, you will understand what I'm saying. As for Richard Wagner, he wanted to join the Freemasons, but they wouldn't let him in, despite having lots of Freemasonry friends. His personal life was too overtly scandalous for their liking. He had cheated on his first wife with the woman who became his second. That second wife was Cosima Liszt, the daughter of fellow composer Franz Liszt, who, by the way, definitely was a Freemason. Quite a high-ranking one, too. Whilst Wagner and Cosima were both married to other people, they had an open affair that resulted in them having three children together. Wagner's first wife died, and he didn't even go to her funeral. Wagner and Cosima begged her husband to grant her a divorce so that they could get married. She became his personal assistant, and organised everything for the Bayreuth Festival and Opera House. Wagner may have written all the music for his Gesamtkunstwerk, a showcase of German total artwork, but it was his Hungarian wife who planned everything. Later on, Wagner was alleged to have had another affair. When Cosima found out, they had a blazing row at about noon on that day. A few hours later in the afternoon, he was found dead, slumped over his desk from a heart attack. I've always wondered about Wagner's death. Was the situation too embarrassing for the List family, and did the Masons clean up? That's entirely speculation on my part, but the mind wanders. Anyway, back to the film. Just as the death cult corner Ringo and cover him in red paint, the mad scientist burst in through the front door with a gun. The cult run away, and the scientists hold the Beatles up at gunpoint. To the amazement of everyone, Paul suddenly returns to normal size, 
complaining of being sticky, but otherwise unharmed. This signals that drugs aren't dangerous, and maybe you should have a go. The mad scientists try to shoot the beetles, but fail. British, you see. Useless. If I had a Luger, says Foot, their scientists are properly equipped. Think on it. The remedy is in your hands, you, the voters. Nowadays, the deep state has managed to fool the public into funding all of their black op projects. But in 1965, I suspect it was still early days. John tells the mad scientist to get out, and then they wonder what has happened to Arme. Arme has snuck away, by the stairs leading to the basement of the house, and we next see her on a central line tube train. So too are the rest of the death cult, who are planning their next strategy to reclaim their sacrificial ring. Somehow, and with no stated reason, the Beatles run off to the Austrian Alps and perform Ticket to Ride. They also ruin a beautiful classic Viennese model Bussendorfer piano by leaving it in the snow, which makes me, as a pianist, want to cry. If that piano was new today, it would probably be worth about £200,000. The song Ticket to Ride is allegedly a drug song, with a reference to riding so high. When they were filming this scene, director Richard Lester and his crew came up with the idea to write a line of the music that was being performed on the screen using the telegraph lines. Their efforts make me, as a music teacher, want to cry. Currently, this would sound like this. So I've done my best to correct their homework. I can't change the backward notes. But now it sounds like this. That's better. During another part of the music video scene, we see Paul drinking with his right hand. We are told in memoirs that this sort of thing was used to help the right-handed Billy in the future. By creating a confusing situation where Paul might equally do things with his right or left hand, Billy could avoid scrutiny if he occasionally forgot that he was meant to be left-handed as Paul. As the Beatles ski away from the now ruined handmade piano, we see them inside a triangle, formed by its upturned lid. As well as being a reference to pyramids of power and the all-seeing eye, it is also the magical element of fire, ironically seen in the snow. Meanwhile, the mad scientist Foot and Algernon are also in the Austrian Alps on a ski lift. They have a plan to hook Ringo's leg as he passes them on a sledge. As they hook him off the ground, we see Ringo as the hanged man tarot card. In Crowley's Toth Tarot, the hanged man card represents the sacrifice of Osiris, and of course, to the Cabal, Paul is the modern day incarnation of Osiris. Next, the scientists sneak a bomb into the hands of George who is playing a game of curling. It results in blowing a hole in the ice. Up pops a crazy cross-channel swimmer, played by the very plucky Beatles roadie Mel Evans, who was covered in goose fat to do this scene and quite perturbed when he had to do it twice. The Beatles are now being watched by the Death Cult, who are also in the Alps. The Death Cult chase the Beatles down the ski slope, Arme directs the Beatles away to safety, while the cult leader Clang accidentally wins a ski jumping contest in yet another Bond parody. After Clang takes first place on the podium, we see the cult's flag hanging alongside the flags for France and Switzerland. The cult's flag has sun and illumination symbolism, and I've included the sun card from the Toth Tarot deck for comparison. In what might be another prophetic move, we see the Beatles hiding as members of an Austrian marching band, quite like the Sergeant Pepper band that they will become in two years' time. 
the shot the producers chose to include in the film is really accurate, as it doesn't include Paul. The continuity shots, however, do include him. I got a comment left on one of my videos the other day by someone who was convinced that all the Beatles knew how to play wind instruments. Judging by these photos, they didn't even know how to hold a rotary valve trumpet, never mind play one. Next we see Clang, the cult leader, laying in wait for the Beatles with a flamethrower. The Beatles are skiing at night, which seems really weird and quite dangerous. Even though they use doubles for most of the skiing scenes, the close-ups seem to be the real Beatles. In any case, with their ski rods on fire, they quite literally light the way down the slope and straight into the train station, bound for home to London. I know they will have shot this scene at night to make the flames seem more impressive on camera in the dark, but I'm also sure that there's a little joke here about the Beatles being trailblazers. So, the jewellers couldn't help them, neither could the mad scientists, and running off to Austria didn't help either. Now the Beatles seek the professional protection of the famous Scotland Yard. As Ringo tries to describe the situation, he says that the death cult's religion is a different religion from ours, I think. I consider this to be akin to masterful speaking. The cabal that plan to sacrifice Paul in real life are in many ways just like the death cult featured in the film. Outside, however, the death cult are trying to hypnotise the Scotland Yard detective over the phone. Using a longbow, they shoot an arrow with a balloon of red paint attached to it through the detective's open window. Another arrow follows, which bursts the balloon. The red paint gushes out like blood. Before I go on to the next scene, I just want to point out how close in real life all the London locations have actually been so far. Pause the video if you want to take a look at this map. After the balloon attack, the Scotland Yard detective calls in protection from the British Army. We see the band playing I Need You in an outdoor studio, which of course is a pure joke. Note that the soldiers shown here to protect the Beatles were not extras or actors. They were real members of the British Army. As the camera pans across George, we realise that the Beatles are on Salisbury Plain, next to Stonehenge, and who knows what sacrifices have taken place there. Some alien contactees claim that Stonehenge is an 11th dimensional stargate. As the camera cuts to an aerial shot, we can see the Beatles are inside a magical circle of British tanks and troops. Looking closer, we can see the faint outline of an equally magical pentagram in tank tracks on the grass. The death cult now form an opposing army and war games ensue as the Beatles now perform the night before. Arme, with some more winking to the camera, saves the day again by sabotaging her own side's plan to plant explosives underneath where the Beatles are performing. By using a reel-to-reel -reel recording of She's a Woman, which of course is a reference to Arme herself, she tricks the death cult into planting the bomb in the wrong part of the field. When the bomb explodes, the Beatles and the British Army jump into action. The Beatles flee, thinking that they are being pursued to death by an enemy tank. Then they realise that it's Armé driving the tank, and she rescues them once again. Using cannons, the death cult blow up the Beatles' tank. Cue another piece of classical music. This time it's Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture, which famously includes cannon fire in the score. Tchaikovsky was another composer who had a suspicious death. Officially, he died of cholera, but many people believe he was in fact poisoned with arsenic as a result of a court of honour death connected to his secret homosexuality. I'm sure if the cabal could have worked it into the plot, they would have rather used music from Tchaikovsky's Queen of Spades opera, which is a supernatural fantasy in which a secret Masonic code to unlocking the true meaning of sacred texts is said to be revealed to the audience if they can decode it. 
Having first thought that the Beatles and Army have been blown up, the audience is then shown that they have in fact escaped into a nearby giant haystack. There must be somewhere in England where one can find sanctuary to think, laments Arme. So the army have failed to protect them. Next they try a well-known palace in the hope that the Queen's protection will save them. The well-known palace is not actually Buckingham Palace. It's Clifton House in Buckinghamshire, which at the time was owned by the Illuminati family, the Astors. It's now owned by the National Trust and run as a five-star hotel. Having previously asked Paul to drink with his right hand in an earlier scene, he is now directed to throw and catch a ball with just his left hand. That, of course, is not a problem for the real Paul, who was genuinely left-handed. Still, these sorts of hand-changing directions add more confusion into the mix as to his identity post-1966. In this scene at the card table, there is a lot of death talk. The Scotland Yard detective says that this wing of the palace is haunted. Ringo says that we won't leave this palace alive. Somehow, the mad scientists, Foote and Algernon, break into the palace in an attempt to gas the Beatles to death and steal the ring. Realising something is wrong, the Beatles throw the gas hose out of the window. This means that the mad scientist accidentally gassed the guards instead of the Beatles. In a strange crossover of themes, the gas they use is red, just like everything connected to the death cult is red. Foote and Algernon then try to shoot the Beatles, but the Scotland Yard detective shoots back and the scientists run off. As they escape, they lay out a piece of US Marine Corps equipment in the form of a relativity cadenza, which makes time slow down. Is this a reference to weaponry designed in secret military programs? Of course, being American, the voltage difference once again makes the fuse blow. The camera cuts to a joke about Battersea Power Station having to change the royal fuse. Notice the Ohm's electrical joke here. Whilst walking with police protection through Chiswick, West London, the Beatles are attacked by a Scottish pipe band. Red paint spurts out of their pipes, revealing that the band was infiltrated by the death cult. I wonder if this is a reference to either Billy, who loves Scotland and was very likely raised there, or to the Scottish farm that Paul was asked to buy for tax reasons shortly before he died. That in itself is a sick joke. He bought the farm and then he bought the farm, meaning to die. The Beatles dive into the city barge pub overlooking the Thames. This is what it looks like today. After ordering drinks, Arme pops up, winking at the Beatles once again, more one-eyed symbolism, and disappearing towards the cellar. As Ringo tries to pick up his pint, Ringo falls through a trapdoor into the cellar. With the door locked, he tries to escape with the use of a ladder. He tries three times to climb up, but all the rungs are sawn through. The three broken rungs reminded me of the three degrees of the Blue Lodge in Freemasonry. Entered apprentice degree, fellow craft degree, master mason degree. Through a side window, an escaped tiger from the zoo enters the cellar. Arme pops up at the window to tell Ringo to sing Ode to Joy in order to lull the tiger to sleep. From the top of the trap door, the Scotland Yard detective and the Beatles look down at the trapped Ringo. The detective also instructs them to sing Ode to Joy because the tiger was a gift from Berlin and raised on the classics. A massive sing-along of Ode to Joy breaks out as the detective starts to sing in German. Ode to Joy, the poem by Schiller, that Beethoven set to music as part of his Ninth Symphony, is both a Masonic and Illuminati song. It was regularly sung in lodges in Germany, even in Beethoven's lifetime. No one is sure if Beethoven was a Freemason. 
but many of his friends and his own piano teacher certainly were. In fact, his teacher was also the Grand Master of the Bond Lodge of the Bavarian Illuminati. Like the other classical composers featured in this film so far, he also had a suspicious death, in his case from lead poisoning, which was possibly a murder. Was the inclusion of both Beethoven and Tchaikovsky's music a reference to the song Roll Over Beethoven, with its line, Roll over Beethoven and tell Tchaikovsky the news? Another famous use of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony was in A Clockwork Orange. Kubrick's film hadn't been made yet, but the novel, which also includes the reference, was published in 1962, the year that the Beatles were signed to EMI. In A Clockwork Orange, the violent criminal Alex loves classical music, especially Beethoven. In prison, he undergoes a behaviour modification called Ludovico Technique. It's a kind of aversion therapy. He watches violent films whilst under the influence of nausea-inducing drugs. One of the films he watches has a soundtrack of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. The unintended consequence is that it renders Alex unable to enjoy the music he once loved. Is the inclusion of this music in Help also a reference to mind control programming? In another leap of logic, the Beatles fly to the Palmers. We're not going there, protests Paul, except they did, for tax reasons. I've often wondered in this scene if the real Beatles are under these disguises. Until I know better, I would assume they are. As we look back at Paul, we notice the press ticket in his hat, which has always reminded me of the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland. Once they get to the Bahamas, the Beatles play Another Girl on the beach. Is this another gender-swapping exercise to disguise an analogy to another Paul, in the form of his doubles and ultimately Billy? Partway through this music video sequence, we see Paul on his knees in an attitude of surrender, while Ringo pretends to shoot him. Meanwhile, the death cult have followed the Beatles to the Bahamas on an airship called Mayflower, which will not need any explaining to my American viewers. The Goodyear sign on the front also bears their logo image of winged sandals or Talaria. The winged sandals are symbolic of the Roman god Mercury, which is also equivalent to the Greek god Hermes. In alchemy, Mercury, Hermes Trismegistus, and the Egyptian god Toth are all the same being in different guises. In Crowley's Toth tarot deck, named after that Egyptian god, he is the main subject of the Magus card. Soon the death cult catch up with the Beatles and a beach chase ensues. Once again, Arme is there to rescue them by taking them into an underground cave. As they enter the cave, Arme informs them that the whole of their temple was transported there just for Ringo's sacrifice, which means that the death cult are, one, really committed to killing him, and two, loaded with money and resources to pull off such a piece of logistics, just like the Rilke Ball. The underground temple makes me think of the Dumbs that exist all across the planet. As Arme directs the Beatles into an underwater escape hole, the rest of her cult pour into the temple. Arme plays dumb about the Beatles' whereabouts, but in so doing, she accidentally makes the magical signal for the element of air and the god Shu supporting the sky. The Beatles swim away and resurface in the pool of a nearby hotel. Somehow they manage to find four bicycles and ride off to their freedom. Halfway down this road, they stop and decide that they are tired of running away and want to go back to punish their would-be captors. As they circle around in the road, the camera pans to the miniature pyramids that line both sides of the highway. Falling for a trap set by the death cult, the Beatles follow a trail of red footprints painted on the road, which leads them to what they think will be a temple. 
As they arrive at the supposed location of the temple, Paul walks past a large number five. This five is the one I was talking about earlier, in reference to the five of swords. Remember that Paul is associated with the sword suit in memoirs. The Beatles, along with the police, enter the mysterious building and straight into an electrified cage. Ringo then falls through yet another trapdoor. He is captured, not by the death cult, but by the mad scientist, Foot and Algernon, and then bundled into a car. But of course, Arme is watching. George jumps on the back of the car. As it speeds away, the car crashes as they try to throw George from the vehicle. While stationary, George loosens the back wheel so the car crashes again. Ringo and George then run off back to the police car, where they are informed of the detective's very famous plan. The very famous plan involves the other Beatles wearing masks and pretending to be decoys of Ringo. We see what we think will be Ringo walking along the beach. He is hit on the head and knocked out. After removing the mask, we see that it is in fact Paul. So far, this has all been very apt. Car crashes, masks used to pretend to be a beetle, and Paul with a head injury. The cabal were quite literally telling us what they were planning to do to Paul here, only one year into the future. Then the decoy plan is repeated, this time with John, who is playing football in front of a sign that reads Tropical Exterminators. The death cult, posing as baseball players, release a smoke bomb and pick up the unconscious John, revealing him to be wearing a Ringo mask as well. The Bahamas police then run in with the words Lifesavers on an advert behind them. The very famous decoy plan does not work, however, as Ringo is then captured at gunpoint. The Beatles and police search for him, but he is in fact a prisoner. The mad scientists have taken Ringo onto their boat, where they are preparing to remove his finger in order to reclaim the ring. Of course, this won't do, and so Arme rushes in to save him yet again. As they try to escape, Ringo and Arme get held up at gunpoint, but she trades their freedom in for the orchid-based wonder drug that she used to shrink Paul earlier on. As they jump off the boat and swim away, they are immediately captured by the death cult. On the beach, the death cult are getting ready to finally sacrifice Ringo, and now also Arme for being a traitor. While a fight breaks out on the beach, Ringo wriggles his hands free. The ring flies off his finger. Ringo climbs up and places it on the finger of the death cult leader, Clang, declaring, Get sacrificed. I don't subscribe to your religion. Arme gets ready to sacrifice Clang, but he too loses the ring. The police, the other Beatles, and the scientists are all on the beach by now, as the ring passes through lots of hands. The song Help is now playing in the background, as full-on chaos has broken out on the beach. Even the mad scientists pick up the ring, but ultimately decide that it wasn't worth the trouble after all. Near the end of the film, we see the return of the cross-channel swimmer, played by the Beatles' roadie Mal Evans. The closing shot of the film before the credits roll is of the beach scene framed by an old Singer sewing machine with the on-screen dedication to its inventor, Elias Howe. I've thought about what this frame means and I've two lines of thinking. The sewing machine was partly invented out of a dream. Elias Howe was struggling to work out where to put the eye of the needle on the machine. One night he had a dream in which he dreamt he was working for a tyrant king, who gave him only 24 hours to finish his design and build the first sewing machine. In his dream, he works very hard, 
that he cannot come up with a final design in time. The penalty for not finishing his design in 24 hours was death. In his dream, he is led away to be executed. The warriors surrounding him are carrying spears with holes near the top. Seeing this, he knows straight away how to finish his sewing machine. He begs for more time. As he pleads for his life in his dream, he wakes up. It's 4am, but still, he runs to his workshop. By 9am, he has finished the design of the first sewing machine. Let's consider the way that the song Yesterday was said to have been written. Paul always believed that he wrote that song in his sleep, waking up with it from a dream. Maybe this dedication is partly about the connection between the invention of the sewing machine and the official story of the writing of yesterday. According to memoirs, however, Paul was actually gifted the song as part of a hypnotic mind control experiment where he was instructed to remember the melody, but not its source. Another connection between the Singer sewing machine and Paul might be brainwashing techniques. Perhaps this singer is not Isaac Singer, the founder of the Singer Company, but Margaret Singer, who was a clinical psychologist who specialised in research into brainwashing, persuasive coercion and the behaviour of cults. In the 1950s, she gained her PhD by studying returning prisoners of war at Walter Reed Army Medical Centre. Those soldiers had been brainwashed into defecting to Korea and denouncing the US. I'm sure that her work, whether she knew it or not, was absolutely invaluable to the cabal. As the end credits roll, we hear the overture to Rossini's Barber of Seville, with added comic vocals from the Beatles, mostly John. No doubt the humorous fun of this music was a chief reason for why it was chosen, but it's also fair to say that the story of that opera was probably also relevant. It's a comedy of errors, in which the main characters lie about who they really are, and frequently disguise themselves as other people. It's a great parallel to the Beatles' psyop, and Billy's future role as Paul. So, that was my analysis of the Beatles film Help. Many of the points I made could well be synchronicities, but equally many of them were probably deliberate. They told us that a band member would be sacrificed, but even if someone could have worked that out all those years ago, we still wouldn't have known which band member until Billy turned up. If I switch off my analytical self, I could still watch this film and enjoy it, but realising that the Beatles really did need help and that Paul was about to die is, for me, heartbreakingly sad. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thanks very much for watching, and goodbye.